Hey guys, Mulper Keenan here, and today we're going to be learning a lot more about advanced cannons. This video will cover increasing your cannon's fire rate, effective cannon layouts, multi cannon turrets, AA guns, and rail guns. You can skip to the section you want to learn about with the timestamp in the description. First, we'll cover how to increase your cannon's firing rate. There are three main bottlenecks that limit your cannon's firing rate the shell reload time from a clip, the barrel cooldown time, and the shell reload time into a clip. To fix our first problem, the shell reload time from a clip, we need to understand how a cannon uses autoloaders. A cannon will go through all of its autoloaders one at a time until it comes back to the first one it used. If the first one isn't reloaded by the time the cannon comes back to it, the cannon will have to wait until the autoloader has loaded a shell before it can fire again. To fix this, we'll need to increase the amount of time it takes for the cannon to complete its cycle. There are three ways to do this. Either decrease the fire rate, or increase the number of autoloaders and clips or use a belt feeder instead of autoloaders. A belt feeder gives you a fast reload time in a small package, making it useful for compact designs. Keep in mind that once the belt feeder's clip is empty, it won't be able to load another shell into the cannon until the clip is completely reloaded. Next we'll deal with the barrel's cooldown time. Every time the cannon fires, the barrel will recoil backwards and then return to its original position. The amount of time it takes to do this is its cooldown time. You can find your barrel's cooldown time here. Some ways to reduce this are adding more gauge cooling units, reducing the amount of gunpowder your shell is using either by removing a gunpowder casing or by reducing the propellant density and adding a bore evacuator to your cannon's barrel. You'll choose one of these options based on how small you want your cannon to be. Making a large fast firing cannon is relatively easy, as you have a lot of space for gauge cooling units. If you're going for a more compact cannon design and can't spare the space for gauge cooling units, I would go for a lower gauge instead. Lastly, we'll deal with the shell reload time into a clip. Ammo input feeders can only load one shell at a time after a set amount of time. This amount of time is dependent on how big the shell is. The bigger the shell, the longer it takes to load. So you can reduce the shell reload time into a clip by decreasing the shell size, meaning the caliber of the gun, and or simply adding more ammo input feeders to the autoloaders and ammo clips. This allows for more shells to load at a time, which reduces the amount of time it takes for the shells to reload into your ammo clips. All three of these bottlenecks can also be reduced by decreasing the cannon's caliber and or increasing the number of barrels your cannon has, which is decreasing the caliber but adding more barrels to your cannon. Next, we'll cover cannon layout. For a while, my cannon layouts look something like this. It worked, but it's not very space efficient. I found that these cannon layouts by Morfiego on the From the Depths Reddit make cannon building much easier. I usually just take one that's the size of the turret I want to make. Then stack it to the height I need. Then I just connect it to the firing piece with cooling units or gauge increasers. Although there's still some minor tweaking, and for some cannon builds it may not be possible to use this method, overall it makes cannon building much faster and saves you time that you can use to work on other things. As you can see with this newer turret design on the left, I took one of the layouts, placed it four times, and modified it a bit. The front two go to two separate cannons, and the back two go to one cannon. The two pictures on the right are of an older model of the same turret. The bottom has the gauge cooling units removed, so you can see the autoloaders. The older model has a sustained fire rate of 40, and the newer model has a sustained fire rate of 55. This doesn't seem like much, but it gives the new design a higher damage output. This cannon has a much higher rate of fire than 55, but if I put it above this, the autoloaders will run out of ammunition, and then the cannon will have to wait until the autoloaders refill, which is time spent not shooting at the enemy, which is bad. Again, you won't be able to use this building method for all of your cannons, but it makes some cannon building much faster. I'm no expert on cannon building, so this method may not be the absolute best thing to do, but it did improve my cannon. 
If you have any better ways of building, please share it. Another YouTuber by the name of Anna Defa has a spreadsheet that you can use to calculate your optimum cannon firing rate. I don't have enough experience with this chart as I would like, so I don't want to explain it to you in fear of getting something wrong, so I'll leave a link to a video where he explains how this chart works. Next we'll learn about multi-cannon turrets. The main thing you need to do when building a multi-cannon turret is keeping each of the cannon's parts separate. You can use the method I talked about in the cannon layout section. As you can see with this turret, it has three chunks of cannon parts. Left for the left cannon, the right for the right cannon, and the back chunk for the middle cannon. This is a simplified version and you can get a lot more complex, like with this cannon, although the main idea still stands. There are still four chunks of cannon parts that each go to their respective cannons. Next we'll cover anti-air guns. I won't go into the specifics of building the cannon itself, just how to turn your cannon into an AA gun. First you want to make sure the mantlet you pick can aim at air targets. One of the AA mantlets would be a good choice. You can make your cannon only target vehicles above a certain altitude. To do this, go into the weapon controller setting and adjust the minimum altitude to engage. Most of the time, I set mine to 10. Usually once a vehicle goes below this altitude, it's crashing into the water, and my main cannons can finish it off. Speaking of which, you can change your max altitude on your main turrets so they don't try to engage flying targets. This can cause problems if you come across large airships that your AA gun on its own may not be able to handle. To get around this, I would simply suggest having two separate mainframes so you can turn them on and off as needed. One for your main cannon, and the other for your AA guns. As for the type of shell you should use, flying vehicles can move sporadically, so most of the time you'll want to use flak or frag shells with a timed fuse. I personally use flak shells for most of my anti-air guns. They're good at knocking out exposed sensitive components like wings, control surfaces, and AI tracking and detection systems. They also have less of a chance to completely miss the target due to their large blast radius. I've had success with other shells as well, like hollow points, AP, Sabo, and Hesh for heavily armored targets. Keep in mind that these shell types need a direct hit on a target to do any damage. You can make your shells explode at a set time or altitude by doing this. Place a laser targeter on your cannon. These can connect to the sides of the gauge cooling units or gauge increasers to the sides of your firing piece. or to a six-way connector. Once that's placed, select it. Here you can see the time sliders and altitude sliders. We'll be working with the time sliders. If the time slider is at zero, it'll explode directly on the target. If it's negative, it'll explode in front of the target, and if it's positive, it'll explode behind the target. Don't set these values too low or too high, as this will cause your shell to explode extremely late or early. I found that setting it just below zero at negative 0.1 reduces the number of times my cannon misses. If an aircraft is flying at my cannon, the shell will explode right in front of the aircraft's path, damaging it. Your cannon and your shell speed will most likely be different than mine, so you'll need to test and see which time works best for your cannon. Next we'll need to add a time fuse to the ammo customizer the cannon is getting its shells from. You won't need to edit the fuse settings, as the cannon will do this automatically. With that done, your shells will now explode at a set time. Finally, we'll cover railguns. Let's start by placing the railgun magnet attaching fixture. These attach to the top, bottom, left, and right of the cannon firing piece. You can place a maximum of four. For this example, I'll place two. Next, we'll place the railgun barrel magnets. These are what propel the shell down the barrel. They attach to the front of the railgun magnet attaching fixtures. The more magnets you have, the more energy your railgun can use from your vehicle's battery, which will increase the speed at which the railgun can propel your shell. Next, we'll place the railgun charger. These pull energy from your vehicle's batteries and charge your railgun. The more you have, the faster your railgun will charge. These can be placed on gauge cooling units, gauge increasers, and six-way connectors. With the railgun built, we'll go into the railgun settings. 
the railgun overclock essentially gives your cannon more rail chargers and magnets. It takes the number of magnets and chargers and multiplies them by this number. This is useful if you have a railgun with very few components. The downside to this is it also multiplies the energy draw by the overclock number, making your railgun less energy efficient. Untouchable Energy Reserve allows you to set a percentage of energy in your batteries that the railgun won't be able to use. This is good to set if you have an electric engine on your vehicle, or you just don't want your railgun using all of your vehicle's electricity. Energy Percent to Use allows you to set how much of the battery your railgun will use per shot. If you set this to 50% and the batteries are below 50% and it fires, the railgun will have a diminished effect on the shell. The higher you set this, the longer it will take for your railgun to charge. Don't fire until battery percent full allows you to set a percentage that if the battery falls below it, the railgun won't fire. Percent of energy used for accuracy buff will trade the shell speed increase for accuracy. This can give you very accurate cannons that can snipe vulnerable components on an enemy ship. The last option in the railgun settings allows your railgun to fire even though it isn't fully charged. This is useful for railgun assisted cannons that don't completely rely on the railgun to propel its shells. It can also be useful on a railgun assisted cannon that's only using the railgun for the accuracy buff. If your railgun chargers can barely keep up with the cannon's firing speed, the railgun's effects will be greatly diminished. A railgun can use normal shells that don't have the railgun casing, but the railgun casing increases the speed and accuracy buff given to the shell. Railguns can use high velocity armor piercing shells to snipe vulnerable components, high velocity hollow point shells, or be used to increase the speed and accuracy of shells with an explosive payload. These aren't all the shells that can be useful in railguns, but these give you an idea of how certain shells can use the railgun buff. I hope this tutorial has given you a better idea of how advanced cannons work, and how to turn your advanced cannon into an AA gun, and a railgun. As usual, if you have any questions, put them in the comments below. Thanks for watching.